Good morning. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I have a, a few slides that I wanted to talk about and basically what I want to focus in on is the opportunities that we have. As Kristen was talking about the organisms that are in the soil, we have a tremendous opportunity to be able to capitalize on essentially what's 400 million years of evolution that has created soil and has helped create life on the planet as we know it. Mycorrhizal fungi, their relationship with the first land plants is what allowed plants to actually grow onto land and to colonize land. And when we tap into that environment, as you can see, these are pictures of the Rodell Institute. This is what the Institute looked like in 1970 when we first purchased the farm. And this is what the Institute looks like in 2015. And this is just from Google Maps, the lower picture. So I didn't doctor this at all. Um, but this is where what we can do. This is the regeneration that we can do when we tap into the opportunity that's given us through the microorganisms that are in the soil. The different things that they're going to be able to do. The ways in which they're going to help us to manage water much more efficiently. The soil is the ultimate filtration system for both clean water and clean air. And it's that carbon that's in the soil. If you talk to people who are in the process of building filters, they'll tell you that the best filters on the planet are carbon based. And it's because the soil is the thing that can do that for us. And the soil, that carbon component of the soil is based on the microbes that are actually in the environment in that soil. They're going to take, as Kristen was saying, they're going to take the CO2 from the atmosphere, it's going to go into the plants, and then the plants are going to give those exudates to the sugar exudates. They make sugars via photosynthesis. You have CO2 and water that's combined into C6H12O6, and that's basically the chemical formula for sugar. And those sugars are going to come out in the roots, and they're going to feed this diverse community of organisms that are in the soil. And when you do that, when you have a system, so we do a side-by-side -side comparison. We have the oldest at the Rodale Institute, the oldest side-by-side -side comparison of conventional and regenerative organic practices. And so what we're doing here is that regenerative organic practices are based on biological inputs and biological methods, and the, the conventional is based on chemical inputs that are costly to the farmer and costly to taxpayers. They're costly to your constituents that are in agriculture, but they're also costly to your constituents that are in, that are just taxpayers because we pay for dredging the delta of the Mississippi River. We pay for cleaning up water in our cities. We pay for floods that happen because we're not taking care of our soil. So you can see in the top picture with a conventional system, these are again side-by-side -side trials. This trial has been going on for 37 years. It's the oldest trial in the United States in the side-by-side -side comparison. And so the top picture, these are pictures field side-by-side. -side. The top picture is our conventional system. And you can see there that you would have uh, occasions in which you could have increased flooding because the water is going to pool on the surface. It's not going to go into the soil because you don't have that carbon filter that's going to be able to pull that water into the soil environment. Whereas in the organic system, you're going to be able to have that water that's going to get into the soil and it's going to be held where the plants are going to be growing for a longer period of time. And that's advantageous in years when you have less precipitation. When we're talking about climate change, we're talking about issues with weather uncertainty. And you, we can debate about climate change and what that means, but the reality is, is that when you're, especially if you're a farmer, the one certainty you have in agriculture is that what, weather is going to be uncertain. And the one certainty that they've seen in the last several years is that that weather has become even more and more uncertain. That there are more prolonged periods of heavy rainfalls. Instead of getting gentle rain all day long that's going to infiltrate into the soil, you get heavy rainfall periods or you get prolonged periods of no rainfall. And that's what's really impacting our systems. So even back in 1995, again in this side-by-side -side trial, you can see that the organic system was able to out-yield the conventional system. And so we may not be able to do that every year, but when we have adversity, which is what we're going to be facing, the tapping into these biological processes, tapping into the mycorrhizal fungi that co-evolved with the plants and have utilized that 400 million years of biological information is going to be the thing that's going to be able to help to grow this system and be able to help it to perform better. So this was in 95. This was in 2015. Again, these side-by-side -side trials. Uh, this farm is up in Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. And um, 
as you can see, most of the people in Pennsylvania in 2015 were experiencing what they consider to be a drought. Drought is not, it's not by definition, it's not a lack of precipitation. Drought is a scouting thing where various service agents are out there in scouting fields and they interpret the fact that because the fields look like that and because we've had not very much precipitation events, that that's gonna be a drought situation. I had a colleague of mine basically say, well, what's the, what's the minimum amount of rainfall that's gonna mean that you're having a drought situation? And I said, it's not based on that. It's based on what people see because that's how we categorize things and what we see above ground and not what's happening below ground. So these fields that are side by side, you can see that one looks like it's drought stressed and one looks like it's not drought stressed. And if you go up closely, the one that looks like it's drought stressed, that field actually was nutrient stressed because it couldn't get the nutrition from the soil because it wasn't working with the biology that's in the soil, that meant that it had to give off extra water and had to utilize some of those resources to try and get those nutrients from the soil when it was trying to produce grain. And that's gonna make it look like it's drought stressed. But what we're trying to do is actually get it set up so that what we're looking at is actually being able to manage water much more efficiently. And that's gonna be a serious concern. Everybody on a global basis, water is going to change the face of this planet far faster than anything else is. And Judith Schwartz is gonna talk a little bit more about what's what, the what impact of water on our systems. But that's what's happening. A lot of the issues that we have in the Middle East, a lot of the issues that we're seeing uh, in um, Asia are all based on water or lack thereof. So if we can utilize these management systems to improve that, that's gonna help us. So this was in 2015. But this is what's happening in the rooting environment. So this is on soybeans. And so you can see in the organic system, these nodules, these are the microorganisms that are on the roots that take atmospheric nitrogen and fix that into nitrogen that's needed by the plants, the rhizobium bacteria. And as you can see, they're not completely missing in the conventional system, but they're right around the taproot. Whereas in the organic system, they're all throughout the rooting environment and there's a lot more root mass. And so what that's gonna do is that's not only just gonna benefit that soybean plant, if it's just on the taproot, it's just gonna benefit that soybean plant. But if it's out there on some of the other fine roots, that's gonna benefit the whole ecosystem. So that next year when we grow corn on this field, we're gonna be able to tap more into that nitrogen that's out in that soil environment so that we don't have to add synthetic nitrogen to the system. We can tap into these processes that are happening to reduce the cost that farmers are seeing in their systems. That's the slide I wanted. How'd that get out of order? I don't know. So this was in 2016, where you have the organic system and the conventional system. Again, we're seeing that same sort of thing, that the corn looks like it's drought stressed in the conventional system. And that became even more later on in the season. So this was in early September. By the end of September, the conventional corn was all brown. And the organic corn was still green. In fact, we had trouble harvesting the organic corn because it stayed green for a longer period of time. And like in many areas here in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, it was warm into December, in November and December. So we had to harvest the corn much later in the season because that plant was still wanting to go through photosynthesis. It still had the energy reserves and it was still trying to give that to that soil environment so that the plants that were gonna be following that could tap into it. The plants, we've annualized perennial plants. This is a perennial plant by nature. So what it wants to do is it wants to give that carbon to the soil in order to be able to tap into those benefits next year. Because we've analyzed it, annualized it, it's only gonna produce annual seed, but it wants that carbon, those carbon resources to give that to its young, to its progeny. And that's the advantage that we're gonna be able to tap into in these systems. So what we found over time is over the 37 years of this study, the yields, overall yields um, in biomass per acre uh, have been about the same between the organic and the conventional. The conventional is in blue and the organic is in green. The profit margin is much higher, so it's much better for a farmer to be in an organic system. Some of this has to do with the higher prices that organic farmers receive. But two, it's very important to remember when we're talking about the price of food, we have a very cheap food policy. So as we go into talking about the 2018 Farm Bill, I hope that you're all thinking about the things that we can do to change our food policy. Because the reality is, is that although the person who's purchasing organic food may pay a higher price, they're paying for the true cost of the production of that food. The 
person who pays for conventional food also pays for the true cost of that food, but they don't pay it at the supermarket, they pay it in taxes. And as all of you probably know, most of your constituents don't want to pay more taxes. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at how we can get this so that we can tap into these things where people are going to be paying the true cost of the food at the grocery store and paying the farmers the true cost of production rather than us having to pay for the loss of ecosystem services. And so the energy that's used is much less in the organic system. So we're going to give off less greenhouse gases in the organic system than in the conventional system. So it's a much more positive type of system that we're going to have. And so basically what we want to do is the new green revolution. We need a new green revolution, but it doesn't actually need to be green. In fact, we need to look at the plants. It actually needs to be a brown revolution. This is where agriculture needs to go, is these types of regenerative organic practices. And organic, in this case, is, is utilizing biologically based methods. So it's not some niche type of thing. It's actually something that's, that is something that all farmers can tap into, these carbon farmers that Kristen was talking about. So what we want to do, and this is NRCS, some NRCS principles that we have here, is we want to minimize the soil disturbance. That's going to help us to add, car it's going to help us to keep carbon, but not really add to carbon to the soil as much as if you add more diversity in your crop rotation. If you keep the soil covered, and especially keep the soil covered with maximizing living roots, getting that photosynthetic activity, having those green plants growing, taking carbon out of the atmosphere, and putting that below ground. And then the other thing that can be really important is to be inserting livestock or to be managing livestock. Some of the policies that we have looking at climate change issues are to take all of our livestock and put them indoors <coughs> so that we can capture methane. We need to have these animals out on the landscape. We're looking at systems that ecosystems that have evolved together. And we're going to tap into that 500 million years of biological processes that are in the soil. And then we're going to tap into the biological processes that evolve later above the soil in helping the system work. So thank you very much.